This video is going to take you through the antibiotics chapter. In the older editions, this is in chapter 21, but in the more recent ones, this is in chapter 20. Um, to start us out, as always, important people. Um, Paul Ehrlich, he is known for looking for what he would call the magic bullet, the thing that would cure bacterial diseases and leave humans perfectly unharmed. So he would test a bunch of different compounds to s try to find that magic bullet. Um, when he was doing this, he was primarily interested in syphilis, which is a bacterial STD. Um, if not treated, syphilis does end up resulting in brain uh, deterioration or neurodegeneration, uh, which can lead to death, not to mention dementia. Um, and so it was one of those diseases that really needed to be cured because it was killing a lot of people and then making those that it didn't kill essentially crazy. Um, one of the drugs that he treated is salvarsin. Um, as you can see on the slide, it is an arsenic compound. Arsenic is a poison. Um, that means salvarsin has what we would now today call a low therapeutic index, which means it's not something that we would want to give to a person except as a last resort. Uh, resort. But whenever he was doing his research, remember, syphilis was going to kill you anyway, so we might as well try this drug that only might kill you, but it might cure you as well. And so it was a step in the direction of having antimicrobials or antibiotics. Um, Prontosil was sort of our next step up. Now, if you remember our antimicrobial susceptibility test, the Kirby Bauer one, where we put those discs on the auger plate, um, Prontosil would not work on a disc like that or on a plate like that, and that's because what happens is Prontosil, there's an enzyme in an animal's body that breaks Prontosil down, and when it does, um, the breakdown product is what actually ends up becoming the antimicrobial. It ended up being the first sulfa drug that's out there, so it prevents bacteria from making the B vitamin fully. Um, if we had only tried it on plates, it wouldn't have worked because it would have stayed as just Prontosil, and then bacteria would still have been able to make their B vitamin. And so it's only once the Prontosil got broken down that it became an active drug. And so he also found a magic bullet, if you want to call it that, but it was one that only works in living tissues. Mm. Now, this is the guy that everybody thinks first came up with antibiotics, and so I wanted to give you those other two people because they were working on this well before he did. I'm always kind of amazed that Fleming gets the credit he did because he was, by all accounts, not the best microbiologist out there. He actually got lucky, contaminated his plates with penicillium. The penicillium gave him that zone of inhibition that we look for in our Kirby Power plates, and he realized the penicillium mold is producing something that's killing the bacteria off, but he could never even purify it. So he screwed up in the lab, contaminated his plates, and said, hey, this mold can kill stuff, but then couldn't ever do anything with that. And yet he is credited as the discoverer of penicillin, which to be fair, he did discover it, but he could never make it and actually treat people with it. Um, next, we start to get into some of the technicalities, the names of some of these things. Anytime you see chemotherapy, it just means you're using a chemical or a compound so that you can treat a specific disease. So it's a very broad thing. It's like the chemotherapy that we use to treat cancer, it's a chemotherapeutic agent. Well, a subclass of that is antimicrobial drugs, or what normal people just call antibiotics, but there's a different definition for that in a second. Antimicrobial means it's a drug that destroy, uh, tries to destroy microbes, and so antibiotics are an antibacterial antimicrobial. Um, antibiotics, your book defines them as antimicrobials that are naturally produced by one species of microbe to attack a different species of microbe. Um, in the more common vernacular, though, an antibiotic is a bacteria-killing drug that you would use in a person who has a bacterial infection, and so penicillin was one of the first ones that was mass-produced and used to actually help heal people, although not by Fleming, he had to have help with it. So, how do we make modern antibiotics? We don't just let some random thing accidentally grow on a plate. We test a whole bunch of things, and when we find a strain that does grow an organism that seems like it might be a good antibiotic, we grow them in broth in pure culture, and we allow them to grow to the point where there's this maximum or huge concentration of antibiotic in that broth. Then we extract it and we purify it, and because bacteria evolve so quickly, we can also chemically modify it so that we can try to stay ahead of bacteria and we're still able to kill them even though they are kind of competing against us in that. This is just one sort of chain on what those looks like so that you can see how we grow them with special machinery. Mm -hmm. All right, 
Selective toxicity means that a drug that we give to a person is going to be selectively toxic to the bacteria, but not to the person we give it to. Like, again, we don't want to kill you in the process of trying to cure you. That kind of defeats the purpose. So any drug that we give you, we want it to be selectively toxic and just kill what we want it to kill. The more selective um, an antibiotic is, the higher its therapeutic index is going to be. Therapeutic index is essentially how safe is it for you to take like Salvarsan had a crazy low therapeutic index because it was just as likely to kill you as it was to cure you before you got to the point of death. So we don't use Salvarsan to this day because it has a low therapeutic index. There are still drugs like chloramphenicol that we can give to people if we absolutely have to, but they still have a low therapeutic index. It's not ideally used, but sometimes we have to resort to drugs that do have a low therapeutic index. Mm. All right, these two terms we defined earlier, it's do you kill them or not? Bactericidal kills them, bacteriostatic just prevents them from growing, and your immune system will kill them. Broad versus narrow spectrum. Broad can kill a bunch of different species, which that's great if you need to treat this person now or they're going to die, but there tends to be a higher risk of side effects with broad spectrum. Most notably, it's going to kill off a lot of your normal flora, and you're going to end up with some side effects as a result of that. Narrow spectrum is more picky. It will only kill some species of bacteria. So if you have identified the causative agent, you can use a specific antibiotic that will kill that one and just a couple of other species, but leave most of your normal flora alone so that you're less likely to have some of those side effects. Half-life of a drug describes how long it's going to stay in your system. Um, what this essentially amounts to is you guys probably have taken antibiotics at some point in your life. Some of them you have to take every four to six hours. This penicillin you have to take every six to eight hours. Some of them you take every 12 hours. They're all different based on their half-life. Some of them your liver breaks the antibiotic down and so you have to take it more often. Some of them your kidneys excrete faster so you have to take it more often. And so different drugs stay in your system for different amounts of time depending on a whole slew of different factors. Mm. Um, Adverse effects that some antimicrobials can have. The number one complaint out there is allergic reactions. Um, it has been intimated at recently that there are a lot of people out there who believe that they are allergic to penicillin, and yet they're not. Um, there are doctors out there that are wanting people who think they're allergic to penicillin to go in and get a skin test to find out whether or not they are actually allergic, because penicillin is cheap and it works most of the time. So if we can find out that the person's not really allergic to it, that gives us a viable way to treat them that might be better. That said, for people who do have an allergic reaction, it can get very severe up to and including anaphylactic shock that can kill you. And so if they are truly allergic to it, they should avoid that med at all costs. Mm. Toxic effects. For any of those drugs that have a low therapeutic index, that means the drug themselves is toxic for human beings. Now, gentosin that you're seeing here, it has a fairly low therapeutic index. Um, it can be used to treat people who have tuberculosis, but it has an increased risk of hurting a person's kidney. And so if a person's already in kidney failure, they should definitely not take this drug. And even for those that have a healthy kidney, they might not by the time they're done with this particular drug. Uh, suppression of normal microbiota. So remember, you've got lots of species that live in your large intestine. One of the things that can happen, especially if you take a broad spectrum antibiotic, is it kills off a lot of those species. Well, then what happens is the species that are still there, they start to overgrow. And those that are still there, they were resistant to that antibiotic that you were given. Two problems with that. One, one of the more common species that can survive and then start to grow, it's known as Clostridium difficile, or C. diff for short. Well, C. diff can create a pseudomembrane and lead to some very, very unpleasant diarrhea that can't be cured through tra traditional means. We talked about fecal transplants earlier on. That's the C. diff problem. Now also notice this person has way enlarged hostra in their large intestine. It's taken on a shape it is not supposed to have anymore. This is a raging C. diff infection that needs really quick treatment or this person might actually perforate the bowel and then have a major problem that's going on. Um, oh, there had been a second problem I wanted to tell you in relation to the, sort of the suppression of your normal flora. Can allow some to overgrow, can give you some side effects. What else did I want to say here? Darn it, I'm never going to remember now. Well, if it comes back to me later on, I'll tell you, but most notably it's that C. diff infection. All right. 
um, intrinsic versus acquired resistance. The very first thing you need to remember is that resistance is about the bacteria, it's not about you. You should be resistant to the antibiotic. That goes back to selective toxicity. We didn't want to kill you to begin with, so you should be resistant to the antibiotic. If, however, the bacteria that is causing your problem is resistant to the antibiotic, well, now we have a problem because we're not killing the thing that is trying to harm you in some way. Intrinsic means the bacteria is naturally resistant to that antibiotic. So a lot of our antibiotics attack the cell wall of an organism. We well, gotta remember some bacteria don't have a cell wall. So they are intrinsically resistant to antibiotics that attack the cell wall. Acquired is different. It means they picked up the trait somehow. Either they had a mutation that allowed them to pick up that trait, that's just evolution in a nutshell. Or they swapped a plasmid with another organism that was already resistant and now they are resistant as well. That's the second thing that I wanted to mention with your suppression of your normal flora. If you have a resistant bacteria that already couldn't be killed with the antibiotic, now you have an overgrowth of that resistant bacteria and we have to use a different probably more toxic antibiotic to try to deal with that infection. So it's another reason to try to avoid broad spectrum if you can help it. Ha! I knew it would come back eventually. All right, so this picture is trying to show you the different targets that we can hit that are unique to bacteria that will allow for that selective toxicity. So first off, remember, you don't even have a cell wall. So anytime we can hurt their cell wall, that's a way that we can selectively harm them without hurting you at the same time. So these drugs are going to attack peptidoglycan. It includes beta-lactam drugs, which penicillin is a beta-lactam drug. It includes vancomycin and bacitracin as well. Nucleic acid synthesis. Nucleic acids are DNA and RNA. And all we have to do here is block enzymes that are unique to the bacteria that we don't have, like topoisomerase, and then we can hurt their DNA without harming yours at the same time. Um, we're not going to talk about polymyxin B. This one is fairly toxic. Uh, metabolic pathways. So there are some things that bacteria are supposed to be able to make for themselves that you don't need to. One of those is folate. It's a B vitamin. The reason that you don't need to is it's an essential nutrient for you. You consume it during the course of a day. Well, bacteria can't do that. So they have to make it for themselves. These drugs prevent them from doing that. Last, protein synthesis. These can hurt transcription or translation and prevent the bacteria from making their own proteins. All right, we're going to start with the beta-lactam drugs. This is what you need to make sure you have written down. Um, remember, you can pause the video at any time so that you can make sure you get what you need. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly. So all beta-lactams are characterized by a similarity in chemical straight, uh, shape where they have this little ring that's called the beta-lactam ring. So we're only going to talk about penicillin and cephalosporin. There are a lot of derivatives of penicillin and cephalosporin. You just change these groups that are sticking off on the side that they have labeled R groups, and you can make penicillin G or cephalosporin, whatever. Um, it's, you can chemically alter them so that hopefully they will act on bacteria again, even though the bacteria has gotten resistant. Um, now, one of the things we're also going to talk about a little bit later on one of the ways that bacteria can gain resistance is they can make an enzyme to break down the poison we're trying to kill them with. Beta-lactamases are enzymes that can break down any beta-lactam ring. And so if a bacteria makes that enzyme, it can deactivate the antibiotic, and now the antibiotic doesn't hurt it anymore, so it has become resistant to that antibiotic. Um, penicillin uh, it's been chemically modified in dozens of different ways at this point, so we do have broad spectrum and extended spectrum penicillins that are available. Um, again, this is one that a lot of doctors um, have labeled people as being allergic to, and they're really not allergic to it, and so they could probably be given that drug fairly safely, but we, we, we need more testing on that, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, cephalosporin, that picture was not there when I made this presentation, darn it. Um, Cephalosporins are Keflex and Cephalexin and anything that basically starts with Ceph, C-E-P-H. This is another beta-lactamase. Um, these are a little bit less susceptible to the resistance because the bacteria have more of a problem breaking these up than they do the penicillins, but it's still possible for bacteria to be resistant to this one as well. Vancomycin has the same target, but it's not a beta-lactam. It doesn't have that ring. This one tends to only be good against your gram-positive organisms, and you almost always have to take it through an IV. So a person's not going home with a bottle of this to chug. They have to be hooked up to an IV, go to a clinic, get it all done. 
And vancomycin also has a lower therapeutic index than the previous beta-lactamases that we had talked about. Um, so it's not some, it's not a first line drug. It's you've got a serious problem that's going on that is risking your life. Then we'll go ahead and use vancomycin because we've run out of other options. Bacitracin is kind of similar, kind of different. It's again, low therapeutic index. So you can't ingest it because it's toxic to you as well. But if you put it in some petroleum jelly, you've got a nice antibiotic ointment. And so you can smear it on the outside of you, but you can't take it orally because it has that very low therapeutic index. Um, amino glycosides are what you have next. So uh, streptomycin, tobramycin, essentially anything that ends in mycin, except for erythromycin and azithromycin, those are a different group. Um, but amino glycosides are going to attack the ribosome. <coughs> now, here's an important lesson in ribosomes for you guys. Bacterial ribosomes are smaller than your ribosomes. They are made out of different subunits. Bacterial ribosomes have a 30S subunit and a 50S subunit. The little S is talking about sedimentation rate, which is if you centrifuge it, which of those is denser and settles faster. Um, so the 50S unit is bigger and settles out faster. 30S unit is going to be a little bit slower. Now, while it is smaller than your regular ribosomes that you have in most of your cell, you do have these exact same ribosomes within your mitochondria. So some of these drugs, if they can get into your mitochondria, they can harm protein synthesis within the mitochondria. So a lot of times there's going to be reduced uptake into your cells, but it'll be really good at killing off bacteria that are free floating. But because they can get into your mitochondria and cause problems, they can have a higher risk of some side effects, specifically as related to the function of mitochondria. Oh, I hadn't actually talked about these, had I? Um, so anaerobes are organisms that you might have living in your large intestine that don't have a lot of oxygen availability, and these aminoglycosides should not be given if you have an infection in that area. Um, you can give it for some of the other, like if you have conjunctivitis or you want to do something with an eye ointment, you can maybe play around with this one some. Um, tetracyclines, doxycycline is an example of this one. This also attacks the 30S ribosome. Um, this one does have a unique side effect in that it can discolor teeth, and so we tend to not want to give it, especially earlier in life, because it can lead to that brownish sort of color to the teeth. Um, this one, kind of like, well, actually nothing that we had talked about just yet, is bacteriostatic. And so this is only slowing the bacteria down, so again, your immune system can come in and wipe them out. It's still a good antibiotic, it's just working differently by preventing bacteria from making their own proteins. Um, macrolids, this would be your erythromycin and your azithromycin. Azithromycin is what you get in a Z pack, which was like the antibiotic de jour of the last couple of years. Tax the other subunit of the ribosome. Um, for people who are allergic to penicillin, or at least think they're allergic to penicillin, Z packs are very often the first thing they're going to go to for that. Chloramphenicol is not the first thing we're going to go to because it has one of the worst therapeutic indexes that are out there when it comes to meds. It actually depresses your bone marrow and it can result in aplastic anemia. But if the person can't be treated with anything else, chloramphenicol is still used. Uh, lincosamides is what you have next. Clindamycin is an example of those. Um, clindamycin does have a higher risk of leading to C. diff in people. And so it should be avoided for people who are at that increased risk of developing that, which we often don't know if a person's at an increased risk unless they have had it in the past. Um, but it's one you, you don't really want to take. A lot of times clindamycin is only given topically, like it's one of the leading antibiotics that's put into lotions for people who have acne. Fluoroquinolones are next. Um, ciprofloxacin is the name of a fluoroquinolone. It's usually just called Cipro for short. Um, this one is the first one that's going to play around with nucleic acid synthesis. So topoisomerase is an enzyme that bacteria have that humans don't. It helps Oh, you guys remember DNA, double helix, it's supposed to be twisted around. Well, topoisomerase makes sure that we twist just enough, too much, and the DNA breaks, not enough, and the DNA breaks. So it's just making sure that DNA is twisted at the appropriate level, and we don't have that enzyme. And so this is something that is very selective towards bacteria, and it does kill them because it breaks their DNA. Now, I did also want to mention up over here, Cipro used to be, and may still be, the first line drug to give to a person who might have anthrax. It's been, holy crap, 19 years at this point since a person mailed anthrax to Congress and some people of the media, but they were uh, disinfecting them, um, decontaminating them, if you would prefer, after they had been into the building. 
and then they were very often given prophylactic courses of Cipro just in case they might have been exposed to anthrax. Rifamycin, uh, rifampin is the a brand name of one of our rifamycins. This one attacks RNA polymerase, a bacterial RNA polymerase that is different from the RNA polymerase that we have in our cells. Um, it's good against not just gram positive and negative, but this is the first one that we're talking about that also is good for our acid fast species, our mycobacterium, that is the causative agent for TB and leprosy. That's a genus, and there's two different species that cause those diseases. Um, so it is bactericidal, which I think I started spelling this wrong in every case. That should be an I, so just make sure you spell that right. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, sulfonamides and trimethoprim are what you have next. Um, sulfonamides are any sulfa drug. Um, like the Prontosil from earlier, it was one of our first sulfa drugs. Um, in order for you to understand how these two drugs work, I'm going to come back and mention uh, folate is a vitamin that is a B vitamin that we have to ingest in our diets. It's an essential nutrient again. Well, bacteria have to be able to make it for themselves. And there's several different enzymes that help them get from a precursor to actual folate off down here. What happens is the sulfa drug blocks PABA, this first enzyme, paraaminobenzoic acid, so that we can't make precursor 1 into precursor 2. And then trimethoprim blocks the third enzyme in the series, so we can't turn dihydrofolate into tetrahydrofolate, which is what's actually going to make the folate eventually. And so if we use both of these together, it's a double hit that makes sure the organism can't actually make folate, and it will die because it doesn't have enough of that B vitamin that it had to have. So. What you need to make sure you have written down here is the sulfa drugs block the PABA enzyme. It is just bacteriostatic. They can't grow without the folate vitamin. Trimethoprim blocks that other enzyme that I'm not going to hold you responsible for the name on. Usually these two drugs are mixed together to make a drug called Bactrim. Bactrim is a sulfa drug and trimethoprim all rolled into one, and it's very often given to help treat UTIs, urinary tract infections. It is just bacteriostatic. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, which drugs are typically used against infections by mycobacterial species also define first-line drugs and second-line drugs. I'm going to start with the back half. First-line drugs are the drugs that you first use on a person when you find out that they have a particular illness. And these are the first-line drugs that the WHO currently recommends when it comes to having TB or leprosy, which is still out there. It's just not as common as it used to be. So rifampin from earlier, streptomycin is fairly decent at this, and then we've got these other ones that we hadn't mentioned earlier, isoniazid, ethambutol, and pyrazinamide. Um, notice pyrazinamide is so new, we don't even know how it works, but it works, so whatever. Just take it and shut up, apparently. Um, mycolic acid is what makes these organisms acid fast. And then this is, uh, again, their cell walls different from the gram positive or negative, and so we're inhibiting some of the enzymes that they use to make theirs. And so this is the first line of drugs that we would give for a person who has TB, is the more common infection that you would see here. Now, the problem with TB is several fold. It tends to be a very slow grower, which means it tends to be a very hard to kill organism. It tends to build up resistance. Even if you have your very first ever case of TB, you're going to be on an antibiotic for at least six months, and really you're going to be on several antibiotics at one time to try to cure your mycobacterial infection for at least six months, sometimes up to a year. It's just that hard to kill. Compare that to you had a UTI. At most, you were probably on an antibiotic for two weeks, and so these are way harder to kill. Because they're way harder to kill, people tend to stop taking their antibiotic before they should have, which means they didn't kill all of the organisms. Some of it is still there, and guess what? It's resistant to the drugs we had just started to use. If that's the case, then we switch to second-line drugs. These are the drugs that WHO currently recommends as second-line drugs. Um, some of these are ones that we had, like fluoroquinolones and aminoglycosides. We had those on the previous table. Um, some of these are brand spanking new, and they're really only used for this. Um, XDRTB is extensively drug resistant tuberculosis, and they can have this one off down here, betaquiline or betaquiline instead, whichever way you want to say that, I am perfectly fine with. So these are, the first line didn't help, let's try these and see if we can get rid of it that way. Um, TB is one that's very hard to treat and it's crazy infectious, so it's, it needs a lot more public health attention in my, in my opinion. Um, I don't think this came from your textbook, but it just kind of shows you which antibiotics can be used for which different species. 
you can Google information that's something similar to this, but one of the very first things that I want to mention is, notice how none of the things <coughs> that can treat bacterial infections are good against viruses. You need to remember they are two completely different types of organisms, and things that can kill bacteria are selectively targeting reactions or components that bacteria have that viruses just don't have. There are treatments for viruses, but they are not the same thing as treatments for bacteria. Also, eukaryotes, they have to have their own treatment because, again, their cells are different from their cells. And so there's different antibiotics or different antimicrobials that you would use for every class depending on what they are and what we can selectively harm in them that you don't have. All right. Um, like I said in the little thing in the notes, we already did the Kirby Bauer test. Make sure you go back and read that in the lab so that you remember zone of inhibition, um, how you compare susceptible, intermediate, and resistant zones against each other so that you know which antibiotics would be the best to use to treat a person. Um, describe four general mechanisms of antimicrobial resistance. One is some of those enzymes we mentioned earlier. Remember that some organisms make beta-lactamase, the enzyme that can break down beta-lactam drugs like penicillin and cephalosporins. Any enzyme that a bacteria can make that inactivates an antibiotic is going to make them more likely to be resistant to that. Um, alteration of the target molecule. So if we were attacking the PABA enzyme and the bacteria changed the enzyme just enough that the drug doesn't bind to it anymore, but the enzyme still does its job, that bacteria is now going to be resistant to that particular antimicrobial, in that case, a sulfa drug. And so if they can alter the target molecule in a way that makes it not bind to the drug, but it can still do its job, they can have resistance. Um, decrease uptake means that the cell is not bringing the bacteria into it, and if it can't come in, it can't hurt the cell. And increase elimination, same thing, the outside. The cell create something called an efflux pump that pumps the antibiotic out of the cell, keeping the concentration inside low so it doesn't kill it. How can bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? There's a whole slew of ways, but you can essentially boil it down to they had a spontaneous mutation, they changed their own DNA, it changed something in the cell, and now it can do something it couldn't in the past, or it can't do something that it didn't want to be able to do, and so it evolved all in this very young. Second is it picked up a gene that it borrowed from somebody else through transformation or conjugation or transduction. Um, it just means it picks up a plasmid from somebody else and then that makes it resistant to them. The groups that tend to be most resistant to antimicrobials are the four that we're going to talk about next. So enterococci. Remember what entero means, stuff in the gut. Cocci means caucus shape. So these are things like enterococcus fecalis. Um, it's a strep species that lives in the gut. It is gram-positive, but it is still an enteric. Um, these guys, the penicillin doesn't bind to their cell wall as well as it could, and so that makes them more resistant to penicillin. Very often, they will have picked up a plasmid called an R-plasmid. That plasmid allows them to make beta-lactamase so they can break down penicillin, cephalosporin, any of those sorts of things. Some of these strains are even now vancomycin resistant, so that even vancomycin, one of our more toxic drugs, doesn't work either. One of the reasons for this is these bacterial species live in your gut all the time. They're part of your normal flora. So every single antibiotic that you have ever taken during the course of your life, enterococci have been exposed to that antibiotic, and they didn't die off. And so they are now resistant to that antibiotic. And so the more antibiotics you take, the more likely you are to have resistant forms of this in your gut. If they get from your gut to someplace else in your body, well, now you have a raging infection that's very difficult for us to treat. Staph aureus, we have talked about in a previous chapter. I mentioned all of that in that chapter, so just get what you mean. Strep pneumoniae. Um, this is, again, part of your normal flora. Um, Penicillin binding protein is going to have a low affinity, so again, it can't bind to the cell and hurt the cell wall. Um, let's see, anything else I wanted you to know about this, aside from what I already put on the slide? Um, this is, again, part of your normal flora, but if it gets to the lungs, it's not supposed to be there, and so then it can cause pneumonia once it gets into the lungs. It actually likes to live inside your nose and is perfectly happy in your nose. Mm. Mycobacterium, we talked about this with the first line and second line drugs earlier. Make sure you just get from the slide what you need. Take a drink, hold on. Okay, 
What are some of the things that need to be done to slow the spread of antimicrobial resistance is what you have next. Number one, doctors need to stop prescribing it if you don't have a bacterial infection. They have gotten a lot better about this, but there are still doctors that just to shut a patient up, they'll give them a prescription and send them on their way because a patient feels like they weren't heard if they don't walk out of there with a script. Patients need to stop doing that as well. But if you have a viral infection like the common cold or the flu, you should not be given antibiotics. Doctors should not prescribe you antibiotics. Um, this is a huge one, and it's one that is not being addressed well at the federal level. Um, there are a couple of books out there that are really good books that you could read for extra credit if you wanted to. I Contain Multitudes and, oh gosh, what was the other one's name? Maybe it'll come to me later on. I wonder if I have it on the shelf behind me. Let me see. Oh, I do. Missing Microbes is the other one. Um, in Missing Microbes, they talk about the fact that we routinely feed antibiotics to the food sources, so chickens, pigs, cows, not to cure disease, not to prevent disease, but because it allows them to get bigger and fatter earlier. So we're giving them antibiotics to promote growth. Incidentally, side link, if you take antibiotics, it does increase your risk of weight gain, but that's a whole other issue. So we need to stop allowing ranchers and farmers to feed their animals antibiotics for anything other than an active infection that they have going on. We should not be giving it to them just as a growth promoter so a farmer can make more money because that means we're breeding resistance on these grounds. And so if you get a chicken that has been infected with salmonella, probably not regular salmonella, it's probably resistant to antibiotics, and now it's gonna be more difficult for us to treat you as well. And so they're breeding grounds for resistant bacteria because they're routinely feeding the animals antibiotics. Um, we need to educate the public better on a whole slew of different things, as it turns out. But one of them, again, goes back to, if you have a cold or a flu, don't go seek antibiotics. They're not gonna help you with a viral infection. You should absolutely, if you have the flu and it, you're within the first 24 hours, try to go get some Tamiflu or something, but you don't need antibiotics because antibiotics only work on bacterial infections. Know when it's time for you to just stay home and try to recuperate, and when it's time for you to actually go out and try to seek medical treatment because you might die without it. Last one, all on the patient one more time. Patients need to follow the instructions. I can't tell you how many students and friends and coworkers I have met that will go get a 14 day supply of antibiotics to deal with some infection, but they'll only take seven days because they felt better after seven days and I'm gonna save these other pills for the next time I get sick. Well, guess what? You didn't kill everything with just seven days. If a doctor gives you 14 days of antibiotics, it's because he or she thought it was gonna take 14 days to kill all of the pathogen that was in your body. If you stop earlier, you didn't kill them all, and now the ones that are left behind are resistant to that antibiotic, and you can't use it to treat it. You need a different, probably more expensive, probably more toxic antibiotic to try to treat it now because you were too stupid to take your whole script. Okay, I'm gonna link to this. She has a very good TED Talk out there about antimicrobial resistance, and I don't think people are taking it nearly as seriously as they should, so please watch McKenna's TED Talk about antimicrobial resistance. Um, next up, we're going to talk about some antifungals, antiprotozoan, and anti-helminth or worms. So, issue with fungus. Their cells are eukaryotic just like yours. They do, however, have a cell wall. Um, unfortunately, it's very difficult for us to hit their cell wall. Um, their plasma membrane, they use something called ergosterol in it instead of the cholesterol that we use. So that's a target that is unique to them. Um, we can try to prevent them from dividing their cells because their cytoskeleton is a little bit different from us. And then they make their DNA with some slightly different enzymes, and so we can try to hit them with that. Mm. So starting with our polyenes, like amphotericin B and nystatin. Um, this does target the ergosterol in their plasma membrane, which again, we use cholesterol, so we're using a different steroid in our plasma membrane, so it's a selective thing. That said, it still has a low therapeutic index, and so we usually only use these as a topical cream, like if a person has athlete's foot or something, or if the person has a life-threatening fungal infection, like coccidioma, uh, can't get that word out, coccidiomycosis, uh, we might give them this too, because that's basically like a fungal form of pneumonia, and it can kill a person. Azoles are next. This is like, uh, I'm a, I can't ever say this one, I'm a dissol or myconazole. 
Um, this is still attacking the ergosterol in the plasma membrane. You can use this one systemically because it has a higher therapeutic index, and so we'll usually use this for like yeast infection or if a person has a dermatophyte, like ringworm is what I'm showing you here. Um, so this is a brand name of one of the azoles that's sold over the counter at this point for women who have yeast infections. Um, you can get them as vaginal suppositories or you can sometimes buy pills where you swallow the pill and it kind of does the same thing. This one happens to be a cream, so you use sort of like a tampon applicator and you squirt some cream up your vagina to kill the fungus that's growing in there. Uh, Griseofulvin inhibits cell division by targeting tubulin. Um, it has greater uptake in fungal cells than it does in ours, which is one of the reasons why it is selectively toxic. Um, if you've ever met a person or, God forbid, had a skin or pr primarily what I'm going to talk about here is nail infection, like you have a fungal infection of your nail, it is so difficult to treat that. Like no over-the-counter thing is going to help you with a fungal infection in a toenail. You're going to have to get this instead. And even then, this is, I mean, I haven't looked at the efficacy rates, but I know a lot of people who have tried to take griseofulvin to cure their nail infection, and even after they've taken their full course, they still had fungusy nails. And so it's one that's very difficult to treat. So this is when I'll remind you, make sure you're drying your feet before you're putting them in your shoes. Don't wear wet shoes around all day. It makes this more likely to form, and it's really difficult to treat. Okay. Next, we're moving on to the things that can treat protists, and unfortunately a lot of these are, we don't know how they work. So iodoclinol, um, this is used to treat like entamoeba infections, which it's a type of amoeba. Um, we, like I said, don't know how it actually works in there, but it can actually kill the cyst, not just the active vegetative cell, and so it's pretty good at that. Uh, nitazoxanide is next. This somehow plays around with the metabolism of a protozoan. Again, we're not quite sure how. Um, this one is used to treat cryptosporidium, which is that water poisoning that you can get, or giardiasis, which is sometimes called beaver fever if you drink, <laughs> I like how they even put a beaver in there, but if you drink some water that is contaminated with giardia, you get explosive diarrhea. Mm. Uh, metronidazole is what you have next. Um, if you've ever heard of flagel, this is flagel or flagel, whichever way you want to say it. I have heard it both ways. Um, this one plays around with DNA. It also screws up electron transport. It doesn't necessarily kill their cysts, but it does work against some anaerobes. And like I said here, even some of the bacteria that weren't being killed by other things, we can use metronidazole to take that. Um, metronidazole is sometimes given to dogs who have a giardia issue too, so you might see it for that sometimes. Folate antagonist. So this is that same folate pathway that we talked about with the sulfa drugs. Um, so yeah, folate metabolism. This is used for toxoplasmosis. I mentioned this one in a different lecture as related to cats and, and why pregnant women should not scoop the cat litter of cats is because they can give toxoplasma to the baby. Um, malaria we've talked about often enough. You get bitten by a mosquito, it spits some of this into you and then you have malaria and we can use this to try to treat it. Um, so crinolones have been in the news a lot lately because President Trump mentioned chloroquine as a possible treatment for COVID. Um, the evidence, while some of the evidence was tainted, we have other evidence that shows chloroquine is not a valid treatment for COVID-19. Instead, something like remdesivir, or more importantly, we have learned steroids are a much better treatment option for COVID-19. So don't do this one right here. If you do have a malaria infection, absolutely take some hydroxychloroquine. Um, or just chloroquine, but don't use it for COVID. Uh, Aflornithine is what you have next. This one um, is going to be used for trypanosoma. Some of the trypanosomes cause things like African sleeping sickness. Here in Texas, there's a disease called Chagas disease, sometimes called kissing disease, although it's not mononucleosis, it's different. Um, it's caused by bugs called kissing bugs, so that's why it's sometimes called kissing disease. Um, but we can give this, it blocks this particular uh, enzyme ornithine decarboxylase. Hmm. Heavy metals. This is going to be like silver used to also include mercury. We don't use mercury anymore because it's super toxic. Uh, this blocks enzymes in a whole bunch of different ways. We usually only use these topically because they have a very low therapeutic index. Uh, Leishmaniasis was something that I worried about when I went to Costa Rica. I went to the Atlantic side of Costa Rica where they have these sand flies, which is what I'm showing you right here. Sometimes if a sand fly bites you, it spits this protist into you, which causes these really horrible skin sores that can be really disfiguring. 
Um, if you go to the Atlantic coast, you'll see a bunch of people running around with these disfiguring scars, especially on the arms and the legs, but it can occur anywhere, especially if people sleep in the sand. But you have to use these really toxic meds to get rid of leishmaniasis. It's really difficult to treat. Um, after that, I have a couple of worm things to add in there. So avermectin, ivermectin is a brand name of that that you can buy over the counter, at least at Tractor Supply is how we always used to worm our horses back in the day. Um, it only hurts the neuromuscular system of worms, and so it doesn't hurt the horse, the dog, the whatever you're using for it. Um, you can use it to treat nematodes. Now, nematodes is any roundworm. That includes heartworms, hookworms, pinworms, strongyloides is a type of nematode. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different kinds of roundworms. It's not tapeworms. Tapeworms are something a little bit different, but whatever. You can use these for essentially any nematode out there. Um, for the homework on this chapter, it's another one of those Quizlet challenges to help you study all of your antibiotics. Make sure you take the challenge, and remember if you beat my time, you can get five points of extra credit on this assignment.